we continue in, in Romans chapter 1 today, for the visitors, Matthew, will be, we've been studying through the book of Romans, we're almost at the end of chapter 1, a couple weeks ago I thought we were going to breeze through these last few verses, and the Lord showed me how we're going, uh, last week, it, for those that were here, if you remember, we looked at verse 28, and the first part of verse 29, and I... After studying, we're not going to finish all the way through verse 29 today. So we'll look at these the characteristics of depravity, you might call them, the characteristics of evil that Paul is listing here. Let's go ahead and read verses 28 through 32 so we can kind of get the whole context. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Mm -hmm. Recall last, last week we talked about the reprobate mind and doing those things which are not convenient and then unrighteousness, wickedness, fornication. If you recall, unrighteousness was that which is not right before God or being in a state of not being right before God. And wickedness was really <coughs> more of a, char a characteristic of Depravity, it was doing that which is wrong on purpose. Right. You know, keep that in mind when we get to the maliciousness and malignity later on. But he begins the next <clears throat> by saying covetousness. I think we all know covetousness is one of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 17. You know, it's the desire to have or to even take something that doesn't belong to us. Right. We can turn back there to Exodus and read the command. Exodus 20, verse 17. He gives several examples of what not to covet. He says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservants, nor his maidservants, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor. <coughs> So he begins by saying these different things, these possessions that were his, that were the neighbors, but he says, nor anything that is thy neighbors. Right. So it is not for us to be covetous of other people's things. Amen. Back in Hebrews, uh, Paul writes, be content with such things as you have, for he has said, you will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Mm -hmm. I am reminded of, a, I think it was Spurgeon with we telling a story he had heard of an old, an old widow woman who was just had some bread and water to eat. And she said, what, all this? And Jesus, too? You bad. Really, she was content with just the food that she had and having Christ. And as a child of God, that should be enough to content us as well. But Amen. Whether we have a lot or whether we have little, we can be content in the person of Christ. We should certainly not be desirous of the things which don't belong to us. Now, we, is it wrong to necessarily want a new car? I don't think so. But when that's consuming you, when you're, <coughs> or you're even desirous to take it from someone, that has gone too far. Amen. I'll turn over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Christ warns us of covetousness he said and he said unto them speaking of Jesus take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses life is a lot more than just things isn't it amen 
Yep, the, at least the American thinking is to get as much things as you can. Mm -hmm. To have the nicest things that you can. But, and it's, again, it's not necessarily wrong to have things, but there's a lot more important things in life than possessions and money and material items. Amen. And as the children of God, that should not be what drives us in this life. It should not be our, our main focus to seek after things of this world. But he tells us to beware of covetousness. It's, the covetousness might start out as, well, that's a, that's a nice car you got over there. Or, mm -hmm. But before long, it consumes this flesh. Before long, you might find yourself compromising to get the things you want. Or, Right. Seeking those things more than seeking the things of God. What did Christ say in Matthew chapter 6? To seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these Amen. things shall be added unto you. Amen. Covetousness makes us seek the things of this world before we seek God. And for, for the child of God, it should not be so. Right. Well, we ought to beware of covetousness, and then he goes on to say maliciousness. Back in our text, it, it's maliciousness is desire and intent to do evil, mm -hmm. especially to do harm. It said righteousness was just being not right with God. Wickedness was purposely doing evil, but malicious goes even farther and it kind of describes a, a craving to do evil, a, a desire to do it. Mm -hmm. Use one example, and I'm not equating speeding to breaking the law of God, but well, I think we all know the speed limit out here. Once you get close to Adam's house, it's 65. <laughs> now, who does 70 or more? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Technically, we are speeding, aren't we? We're going out with not right, whether we intend to or not. It's very easy to go that fast in my car and not realize it. <laughs> But wickedness would be like, well, I know this people are 65, but I'm, I'm running late for work, so I'm going to do 75. Right. Maliciousness goes even one step farther and says, well, I don't care about the law. I don't care about them police. I'm going to do what I want to do. They can like it or not. Mm -hmm. Right. But isn't that, that's really at the heart of every unsaved person, though, that they're going to do what they want. Whether we like it or not, whether God likes it or not. Right. We can, you might say, well, I've never been that way. But yet, if you were truthful before the Lord saved you, you certainly had that same desire in you. Titus chapter 3, let's turn there for just a moment. Well, this verse and our next verse will mentioned a couple more times as we're looking here. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 3, though. It says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lust, and pleasures, living in malice, that is, the same as maliciousness, and envy, hateful, and hating one another. Mm -hmm. Notice, but after the kindness and love of our God, of God our Savior, Toward man appeared. Amen. See, before God appeared to us, we were living in this. He says, malice and envy, hatefulness, this serving lust and pleasures. And yet, so is the, the natural way of all men. Mm -hmm. and unless God intervenes, they will fall after those things. Unless God had saved us, we would be living in still such a state. Mm -hmm. The falling after this wickedness and maliciousness, and not only desiring, not only doing that which is wrong, but desiring to do it, and really not caring about the consequences. Right. We turn over to First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two and verse number one. Look at verses 1 and 2. He says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, there it is again, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, 
and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that Amen. you may grow thereby. Here he tells us to lay, to lay aside the mouth, put it away from us. And instead, we ought to desire the word of God. Rather than desiring wickedness, we should desire God's word. Amen. Amen. The only way we can combat that desires in the flesh is through Christ and through the Word of God. Amen. So remember that verse because it's <laughs> important to a few other points we have. He doesn't say we're to put it away in the closet and bring it back out later, does it? <laughs> we're to lay it aside and leave it behind. Mm -hmm. Just as Hebrews 12 tells us to lay aside every weight and sin which just so easily beset us, so us from patience and race that set before us. To truly run that race, to truly walk the Christian life, we have to put those things away and not Amen. bring it back up again. Let's go back to our text over here in Romans chapter 1. After maliciousness, he lists full of envy. Mm -hmm. so, much like covetousness, but it, it usually also contains some resentment or jealousy with it. You know, I can't just be happy that Matthew's driving a nice new car out there. I know it's not his, but <laughs> I'm jealous that he is. I'm resentful that he is. Right. Well, not only did they have envy, but so they were full of it. Mm -hmm. They were literally filled up with it. They were. Much like we'll be on Thursday, stuffed with food, they were stuffed full of right. envy. Again, these envies were mentioned in the verses we just looked at in Titus and as well as 1 Peter. That we, were to, that we were full of envy before the Lord saved us. And yet, as the children of God, we are to lay those things aside. And then, said, so seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Rather than let, it, let those feelings of envy consume us, we should be content with such things as we have. Mm -hmm. Rather than letting the desire for other things come to the point where it makes us jealous or resentful, we need to realize that our life doesn't consist just in material possessions. Amen. Well, this. Envy is also listed among the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. If you remember that particular passage, he says that they which do those things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> Envy is one of the things that are not, should not be characteristic of a Christian. But I don't think that means that if you envy something one time, you're automatically going to hell. But we should not continue on in those type of things. But Amen. We, whether it be fornication, adulteries, whether it be envying, and so on, those should not be characteristic of a child of God. Amen. Because they are characteristic of the wicked. They are, as we said, they're called the works of the flesh. They are opposed to the fruits of the spirits. If we go on back to our text here, he goes on from full of envy to say murder. I think we all know murder is the intentional taking of another's life, and yes, I believe abortion is also murder. Amen. And murder is universally considered evil, even among most unsaved people. Right. At least in theory, they. Can. But yet, murder is not necessarily the unforgivable sin that many people think it is. Right. We, have, we also sometimes don't think of it as seriously as, seriously as we should. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 and verse 15 says, Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. <laughs> and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. To be guilty of murder doesn't mean you have to even physically kill someone. He says just to hate them mm -hmm. is to be a murderer. Murder begins in the thoughts. Amen. Yes, eventually, and then it comes out in the actions. 
we are no less guilty if we think such things than if we actually commit it. Amen. At least as far as in the eyes of God, that is. We turn over to Matthew chapter 15, we'll see that murder really is in the heart of all men. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. Here it is again where the Pharisees were ridiculing disciples for eating with unwashed hands, and he says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. From out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These things, or these are the things which defile a man, but evil with unwashed hands defile not a man. He says, Murder proceeds from the heart, as well as these other things. There will be adulteries, fornications, thefts, blasphemies, false witnesses. The problem with all of these that we're looking at is they're a problem of the heart. Mm -hmm. And this wickedness that comes out of man is really just what proceeds from within, him, within the man. His heart is evil, therefore evil comes out of him. And the point that Christ was making was it doesn't matter if you eat with dirty hands, what really makes a difference is what comes out of the mouth. Amen. What goes in the mouth, when it goes in the mouth, it's going to come out one way or the other, but what comes out of the mouth is really what <coughs> shows who you really are. Mm -hmm. Paul, before he was saved, he was described as breathing out murder. He used the word slaughter there in Acts chapter 1. But, it says, and Saul get breathing out <laughs> the slaughter and threatenings and slaughter. Mm -hmm. he, that's when he went to get the letters to go to Damascus to persecute the church there. We know the Lord saved him. But even uh, Paul, as great as a example we have with him before his conversion, he was yet full of that sin as well. Amen. We can't think that it's not within each and every depraved heart to think of murder and even to commit such things. I also want us to notice one thing over in Revelation. Revelation chapter 9. The natural man is not going to <laughs> repent even of murder. Right. And, you know, murder is generally considered a bad thing among well, even the lost people, but he, but the natural man is not going to repent on his own. Revelation chapter nine, beginning in verse fifteen, we see the this army, if you will, of horsemen come up against the earth in judgment. Verse 15 says, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000. Thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and the brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these were three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads with them that do hurt. Like it. Whether you want to take that as literal or figurative, I can't imagine what you know, right. against these horses that had heads as lions and tails as scorpions and breathed out fire. You would think that would at least scare someone to do right. But yet, notice what it says in verse 20 and 21. And the rest of the men which were not killed by the, these plagues yet depended not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship the devils. Of, and idols of gold, silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor their fornication, nor of their thefts. Mm -hmm. so despite a whole third of 
men being killed with these beasts. You know, it says they would not repent of these things, mm -hmm. even of their murderers. Yeah, man might say that he thinks murder is wrong, but down deep in his heart, he is really guilty of the same. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to our text in Romans. He goes on to say from murder to debate. This word debate does not mean in a structured sense like we see political debates, even though they're not always well structured either, but <laughs> right. But Biden and Trump weren't exactly debating when they debated, but this word debate means contentions, strife, quarrels, what we would call arguing. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly man is given to arguing, isn't he? Right. To, to be contentious with one another, to, I mean, I could say even myself is guilty of this, but we, we think we're right, and no one's gonna prove us wrong. Right. Yeah. That should not be the attitude of the Christian. And yet, the Corinthians had this problem. Mm -hmm. Turn over there and see this. First Corinthians chapter 1. Paul, in one of his many rebukes in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 11, he says, For it hath for it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which were the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. I'm sure the Corinthians thought Chloe was a talent tailor. But. <laughs> Verse 12, he says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Paul, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you or baptized in the name of Paul? And they were arguing about... <laughs> Who baptized them and who, how were they saved or who, by who were they saved? And so they were followers of, some were followers of Paul, some were followers of Apollos, some of Cephas or Peter. I mean, it seems foolish to think about it. A man will argue over just about anything. Right. Notice verse 14, Paul got so fed up with them, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Cephas right. but Crispus and Gaius. He was. Thankful that he hadn't baptized any of them except the two. Mm -hmm. They couldn't say that he was a Paul because verse 15 says, Lest any of you should say, I have baptized in my own name. Mm -hmm. Paul didn't want to be charged with baptizing by his own name. In fact, in another place he would say, I came not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, verse 17. Yet, yes, even we as Christians can. Be contentious or argumentative with debaters, as it's called here. Mm -hmm. we, got, we are called to be in unity and one accord as the church and his people, even among the, you know, our dealings with the unsaved of the world. We're not to be really argumentative towards them. We should share the gospel, we should tell them of Christ, but you can't shove the gospel down someone's throat. That's right. Amen. Unless someone has a willing heart to receive the truth, they're most likely to argue with you about it. They're certainly not going to willingly receive it unless God has opened their hearts. So arguing with the wicked is not going to do us any good. Amen. So you can't beat a fool by his own game. No, we can see here that this characteristic, this debate, this contention and strife is just another characteristic of the wickedness of man. Amen. We can thank God that one day we'll be in a place where there won't be any of this strife and envies and so on. Let's go back and look two more things before we close up here. He says deceit. Next. See, that's trickery, deception, it's guile, how it's often translated. But the world is very full of this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Full of deception, full of trickery, full of things that are enticing, but yet are really not good for you, especially mm -hmm. as a child of God. Yeah. 
But man is deceitful, though, in his natural state. He is. We see Jacob, he was a, even though he was chosen of God, he was a, a trickster. Right. He was deceitful to his own brother, even, to his own father. So that is within the heart of man to be deceitful, to be given to deception. To, man. We try to spin things to make ourselves look good, and that really is what falls under deceit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. not, Amen. Maybe we did something wrong. If we're not fully truthful, we start smooth over and make ourselves look good. That's that's what deceit is. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you don't believe man's given it that, just have some children. They'll teach you that very quickly. Amen. Let's turn back to Mark. This is a parallel passage, so when we look at Matthew 15, Mark chapter 7, again we see that this deceit or dial that is called here is an indication of a problem with the hearts. And I don't mean physical hearts. Matthew 7, verse 20 through 23, again it says, Jesus speaking, it says, and he said, that which cometh out of the man that defiles the man from, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceits, blasphemousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Amen. Sorry, it is called deceit here. It's in, called God, First Peter 2, where we looked earlier, to lay aside God and seek the word of God. See, once again, this is something that proceeds out of the heart of man. Even if unsaved, they can clean themselves up. They can act like a good person. They can have some morals, and yet within is still full of these wicked things, including deceit and murder, and lying and stealing, and so on. That is what's within the heart of the natural man. That's what will come out of it to itself. Let's go and look at one, more, one last point here. Malignity. This means mischievous or being evil-minded. It literally means bad character. It, really, it points to the thoughts and intents of the heart, that they are corrupt. Mm -hmm. the way it, we know the word malignant. When talking about cancer, it means it's mm -hmm. kind of spreads. That's exactly what this this thing does here in malignity. It spreads throughout the whole being mm -hmm. to affect not only the thoughts, but eventually the actions and the habits and the whole of man has become full of this evil mindedness. Mm -hmm. We see that man just come, becomes that way over time. Uh, back in Genesis when God looked down upon the earth and saw the evil. The imagination of the hearts of man were evil continually before he destroyed it in Noah's day. And so it is with man today that his thoughts just become more and more corrupt and he is eventually full of this evilness. Mm -hmm. Just like a cancer that spreads until it kills, so is this malignity. It spreads, this evil mindedness, it spreads within man. Amen. It completely consumes him. Eventually, we'll physically kill him as well as he's already spiritually dead from it. Right. So all these things are problems with the heart, and I don't mean such as congestive heart failure or arrhythmia. I mean right. The spiritual heart within man, and man can do all the good works he wants to. Man can be baptized. Man can join the church. Man can be an upright citizen, and yet. Till God gives new hearts, he will still be evil from the core. Amen. Let's turn to Ezekiel and we'll close. Ezekiel 36. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36 and verse 26 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. 
Amen. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. That this is what the new birth does to us. It gives us a new heart, a new spirit. Mm -hmm. Changes us from with, really from the very core of our being. But without that, man is corrupt and will continue to be corrupt no matter what he strives to do, no matter how hard he strives to be a good person. Unless God gives that new heart, he will always be corrupt at his inner being. Amen. We'll go ahead and close there. I think the whispers go along with the backbiter. The Lord will look at that next week. I, I thought we would be done with chapter one by now, but the Lord <laughs> showed me different. So. Amen. We'll continue next week, Lord willing.